Good morning, church. Does anybody know what a, you know, if I said a trust fall, do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what a trust fall is? Yeah, so they, they use it for, for team building, which I, I think sometimes is rather interesting. I, I went out and, and um, we were doing team building and you learn to trust your teammates, right? So they, they stand you up on this platform, they turn you backwards and your teammates are standing down here holding their arms out and then they blindfold you, right? And you're supposed to just fall back into their arms. And the team that I did it with, they actually went up a notch. They walked you around to get you disoriented. So you weren't sure who was behind you. And the person who tells you, go ahead and fall back, moved to the other side. <laughs> so it took a lot of trust to just fall backwards. Now, I want you to imagine, as, as anxious as that might be, to have you close your eyes and just fall backwards into your teammates. What if, what if all of your teammates were blindfolded too? How would you feel about falling backwards into their arms? Take a lot of guts, wouldn't it? Maybe a, a lack of common sense. <laughs> but this picture that you see on the screen, right? This is a picture of the world. It's the blindfolded leading the blindfolded. And we wonder why we continue to stumble and fall and fail one another. We wonder why life hurts so much at times. It's because the things that we're turning to and the things that we're holding on to and the ones that we're depending on to give us direction through life are just as blind as we are. And that's what God's word is going to address with us this morning. You see, part of God's plan for our salvation recognized that we have a world walking in spiritual blindness. And what they need is they need someone who has their eyes open, who can see the light, who can lead them in the ways of God. And that means that part of our purpose and our calling in Jesus Christ is to point others to that eternal salvation that God has in Jesus so that they might know how to navigate life in the ways of God versus the ways of the world. And what's interesting is, as you and I give our lives over to being used by God, to be a witness to others, to Christ, one of the things God's Word also reminds us of is where we're going to find our true joy in life that we are passionately and fervently pursuing every day. It's going to be found right here in the person of Jesus Christ and using him, using us to share him with others. So as we prepare to go to his word this morning, I want you to thank him for the light that he's given you to the truth of God for his creation, for the truth of God for your life, and ask him to use you as a witness to the world in this coming week. Take a moment and go to God in prayer. God, we see a picture of, of blindfolded people leading blindfolded people, and we kind of chuckle at ourselves, and we think of just how cumbersome and awkward that is, and, and how you can just see it's prone to failure, God. But yet, too often, we turn to the world. We turn to those in spiritual blindness to guide us through life. And God, we confess that you are the only one. Your son is the way. He is the truth. He is the life that we seek in this life. And so, God, we give you thanks and praise that we claim him as our savior. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us through life, to help us navigate the things of life. And God, our prayer this morning is that as you speak to us from your word, God, that your spirit would just give us a passion to be your witness to the world in their darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last week we began our short series in the Gospel of John, and we talked about the fact he begins his gospel by making certain everyone understands this Jesus that John is going to reveal in his gospel, this Jesus that we've heard people talking about was, was absolutely a man that we all know and, and who walked this earth and who lived a life and who died on the cross and who was buried, but who also rose from the grave and who ascended into heaven. This Jesus was actually not just fully man, but he was fully God. He wasn't an ordinary person is how John starts this gospel out, the, the, the power that he begins with. And this morning he jumps ahead from declaring the eternality of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God himself, and he jumps to the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry. And all four gospels start 
their description of the beginning of the ministry of Jesus with the coming of John the Baptist. And that's where John the Apostle goes this morning in verses 6 through 8 of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Read along with me. He writes, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Before Jesus was born, God had been silent in the lives of the people of Israel for over 400 years. Yahweh, the God that they knew as the God of Israel, who had led the people out of their bondage, who had led them through the wilderness, who had brought them into the promised land, the God that they continuously and regularly walked away from generation after generation after generation had gone silent for 400 years. Now, they might be forgiven, as, as we would think about it. If you haven't heard from somebody in 400 years, what are the odds you're going to hear from them? We might forgive them if they had begun to think, God really has forgotten us. He really has set us aside this time. We crossed his path one too many times. It doesn't look like he's coming back for us this time. For 400 years, we've struggled in silence. Maybe some of us this morning have that feeling. We know that feeling. Maybe, maybe we're struggling with a, with a health condition that we don't see our way clearly in. Or, or maybe we're just lonely. Maybe we just have, have lost the relationships that are near and dear to us. We feel alone in a big, wide world. Or maybe it's just some unending struggle that we've had that seems to go on and on day after day, month after month, year after year, and there seems to be no end. And, and you might forgive us if we begin to wonder, God, have you forgotten me? God, did I offend you one too many times? I really did it this time. Where are you, God? That's where Israel had found themselves before Jesus came into the world. But Jesus is not only eternal, but God's plan for our salvation in Jesus is eternal as well. John's arrival was the fulfillment of the prophecies, the promises of God concerning the one who would precede the coming of the Messiah. And that's why the Apostle John makes very clear, John the Baptist was sent by God. He didn't just randomly show up on the scene and start calling people to repentance and telling them to turn away from their sin and to turn back to their God and see if he could make a living off of it. John was sent by God. He was part of a plan by God that has existed in eternity past for our salvation. And while he had been silent for 400 years in the lives of the people of Israel, while there are times and seasons we feel like he's silent in our lives, in our desperation, our despair, in the things that we struggle with, God was always present. He was always active. You see, God's promises and plan for our salvation are certain and true. They are part of an eternal plan. John the Baptist was a part of that. Life is not random. I know at times it seems like we're in control, that we're setting the, we're setting the pace for life, we're setting the goals for life, we're setting the rules for our life. But the reality is all of life occurs under the authority of God. All of life is subject to the sovereignty of God. All of life is part of an eternal plan of God at the core of which is his desire and plan for our salvation to come to faith through Jesus Christ. 
We can trust God is active and working in our lives, even in those seasons we don't see him. Even in those times when we just don't know how we're going to get through the day, and we just are desperate for God's hand and his presence in our lives, and it feels like he's not there. But what, one of the things to take away this morning is God's plan is always in motion. God's presence is always with us. His Holy Spirit lives within us. That's what God has given of himself to us. And John was a part of that eternal plan that he had set in motion in eternity past. And because God had a plan, God also had a very specific purpose in his plan for John the Baptist. Just like God has a very specific purpose in his plan for each and every one of us here this morning who've claimed Jesus as our Savior. None of us are without a purpose for God in life. I know that the world sometimes tries to set us aside to tell us we're not relevant, to tell us we're not needed, to tell us we're not wanted. To tell us that the world can go on quite well without us. But God has a different message for us. His message is he's called you, he's called me into this relationship with his son to be a part of this plan he has to bring the world back to him through his son. This is what God's word says about John the Baptist. He said he was God's voice in the wilderness. That was our scripture passage this morning in Isaiah 40. The voice that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That was John's mission. He was to prepare people for the coming of their Savior that they'd been waiting for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for. And John, you have the privilege, you have the honor, you have the blessing to declare the Savior is come. The prophet Malachi talked about it. Malachi 3.1, he says, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine John was the herald for the coming of the promised Messiah? They hadn't heard from God in 400 years and now all of a sudden John is announcing he's here. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the angel Gabriel's promise to Zechariah. You might remember Zechariah was one of the priests of Israel. He and his wife Elizabeth had no children. They were very old in years, sort of like Abraham and Sarah, way past childbearing years. The angel Gabriel shows up. Before he showed up to Joseph and Mary, he shows up to Zechariah while he's in the temple worshiping. And he tells him he's going to have a son. His wife's going to have a son. And this was the purpose that he told Zechariah his son would serve in Luke 1, 15 through 17. Gabriel tells Zechariah that this son that he's going to have will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John's mission was to tell people, you are dying in your sins. You are separated from your God, Israel. You need to turn back to the Lord your God. Turn out of the ways that you've been walking that have taken you far from him that are leading you into an abyss of eternal separation and condemnation from your God. Turn back. Because the Lord is come. He's come to bring you home. Now the purpose that John says, he summarizes it this way. Zechariah tells him it's to turn the people back to God. John chapter, uh, verse 7 of John chapter 1 says, He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him, through John. Now, witnesses for the people of Israel, for a Jewish person, it was a big deal. 
you needed two or three witnesses to prove any fact. And it was written into the law of Israel that if a witness were to lie, it's not like you might get a slap on the wrist or you might have to go serve a, a week or two for perjury or whatever it might be in, in a prison cell. You could be subject to the same penalty that the person you were testifying about would be subject to. So if somebody was up for the death penalty for having committed some act and you lied to somehow protect that person, as the witness that lied, you would have the death penalty imposed on you. It was serious business. People did not screw around as witnesses in the time of the people of Israel. So if somebody was hearing that he's come to be a witness, one, one of the things they know is he's going to be telling the truth. Because nobody's going to lie about something that you could lose your life potentially over. A witness was a big deal in that time. But one of the things that's interesting about this passage is saying that what he came to be a witness of was to be a witness about the light. Now let me ask you, do I need to tell you that the lights are on? You can see that, can't you? I don't have to tell you if you're standing in darkness or you're standing in light. You can all tell whether you're in darkness or in light. And not only that, Jesus said he didn't need the witness of men. He says in John chapter 5 and verses 36 to 40, he said, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. The very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. And then he goes on in verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. So he said, you've got my works, you've got my father, and you've got the scriptures that all bear witness of me. And he closes with this. He said, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So if light is self-evident, and I don't need to tell somebody whether they're standing in the light or the darkness, and if Jesus has the witness of his works, his Father, and God's word, why in the world did he send John the Baptist? Well, Paul explains it this way to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You see, even though light is self-evident, even though we have the testimony of God and his word and Jesus' works, Paul reminded the Corinthians, he said, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's what Jesus told his disciples. I've got these testimonies. I have these witnesses, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So while light is self-evident, if we're blindfolded, we can't tell whether we're in the light or the darkness. That's the reason God sent John. So that flesh speaking to flesh, mortal man to mortal man, there would be a testimony to the fact that spiritually we're all born blind. We can't see what we can't see because we literally spiritually can't see. Our minds are blinded. John's role was to help people remove the spiritual blinders, to convey to them, to convict them through God's spirit of their need to remove the thing that blinded them, to see and come into the light of Jesus Christ. And that's our calling as followers of Jesus today. You know, the last words that we have recorded of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, in Acts 1.8, it's so familiar to us, right? He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then he says, and you will be my witnesses. Not might be, not should be, not I would like you to be. You and I are a living witness to Christ Every breath we take, every step we make, you and I are a testimony to Jesus. The question is, 
Is the testimony true as witnesses of Christ? What are people seeing in my life? What do people hear come out of my mouth as a follower of Jesus? We're not even at the part of the greatest desire we should have in life is to share the Savior that we know who's brought us eternal life with whoever would have ears and want to hear us. But even before we get to that point, we're a living witness. We're a living testimony to God. Is the testimony true? God doesn't need us to reveal him to man. That's what Jesus said. I've got my works. I've got my Father in heaven. I've got my Father's word. I don't need anything else. But God's desire, part of his plan for salvation of all, is that he uses us to lead others to God's revelation of himself. He uses us to simply have people take off the spiritual blinders to see the truth and the reality of who this God, their maker, is. Last week we talked about the fact that, you know, Paul told the, 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 in his letter to Romans, said, look, God's evidence is all about us. The psalmist in Psalm 19 said, look at the heavens. If you just take off the spiritual blinders, God is evident and he's everywhere. And when you know who his son is and what his son has done, you're not going to hesitate. You're going to rush to him. You're going to reach out to him. You're going to want all of him. You're going to want all that he has for you because you're going to recognize what it is you were made and designed for. And that was you were made and designed for community with your creator, God. And God's desire is that all might believe. That's what he said John's purpose was. He said he came to bear witness about the light that all might believe through John. That's God's heart for us. The reason he hasn't come and taken us out of this mess of a world that we're in as his church is, Peter said, because God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And part of his plan for making that offer clear and available is you and me being this witness that John was to, in his time to you and I being that witness for him here in the place that he has us in our time. God had a plan. It involved a purpose for John. It involves a purpose for us. The question is, how are we going to go about, how are we going to live this plan out? And how did John live this plan out? You know, John lived in the wilderness, as best we can tell from Scripture. It said he was clothed with not fine robes. He was clothed in camel hair, ate locusts and honey, like the earliest of survivor shows, I guess. I don't know. But John the Apostle in his gospel here makes something else very clear about this mission, this purpose that John had. And this is what he says. He was not the light. It was not about John the Baptist. And John the Apostle wants us to make that and understand that very clear. This isn't about, oh, this great man John. Because you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, as great as John was, he's going to be the least among the saints in heaven. This was not about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was about Jesus the Savior. Luke records the prophecy of Zechariah, John's the father, after John is born. And this is what John the Baptist's father prophesies about him after his birth, this little baby in Luke 1, 76 or 77. He said, you child, talking about this infant son, John, that we know as John the Baptist, you child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of of their sins. Zechariah understood the purpose for which God had given this son to him and to Elizabeth. And he's prophesying over his son that the object of his life, the focus of his life, the priority of his life, the whole purpose of his life 
was to declare the salvation to come in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins to be found in Jesus Christ. And what was interesting is John grew up knowing this was his calling. In fact, John knew this was his calling before John even came into the world. You know, if we go back and look at Luke chapter 1, verses 41 through 44, you may recall that John the Baptist and Jesus were, were cousins. Elizabeth and Mary were related. And it says that when Elizabeth got pregnant, she was pregnant about six months before Mary. The first time that Elizabeth comes to Mary, this is what Luke describes happened. It said, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. This is John. And then and down in verse 44, Elizabeth says to Mary, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. In his mother's womb, John knew his joy was in Jesus. And he lived with that in the forefront of his mind throughout his life. And the way that we know that is because after John had been out in the wilderness calling people to repentance, he built up quite a following. We don't know how large, but it seemed to be rather significant. And people were coming out into the desert seeking repentance and forgiveness for their sins. And so John had built up these disciples. He would built up this big following. And then guess what happened? They opened a church down the road. And you know what happened? Some of John's people started going to the new church. It was a church of some guy named Jesus. And the, his, his disciples were flipping out. His, his disciples come to him and says in John 3, 26 through 36, Rabbi, they're talking to John, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, talking about Jesus, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. What are we going to do? Offerings could drop. We just built this great desert to hold everybody. They're losing their minds. And this is what John's response was. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. And now listen to this. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Therefore, this joy of mine, this joy that began in his mother's womb, he says, is now complete. He had realized the fullness of why he lived, to declare the coming of Jesus Christ. And so he was more than happy to declare he must increase, meaning Jesus, but I must decrease. To fulfill his purpose, John had to be focused. His priorities had to be kept in line with God's plan and purpose. There were so many things that could have distracted him or derailed him. I mean, just his, his living conditions, there had to have been misery involved in living in, the meager, living in the meager environment that John spent most of his life in. He certainly would have had every up and down of humanity that any of us experience in his context and his time. And then he became enticed by the popularity that would come with people flocking to hear your message, flocking to, to hear your word and to respond to your word. And, you know, in that humanity, that pride is so easily welled up inside us. And, and he could have fallen for that as well. And jealousy would be something that would certainly could have derailed him. When Jesus shows up and his followers, these people that he thought were his, are now going to Jesus. John couldn't compete with Jesus. You know, we don't have John recording any miracles. All these people were coming to John because he was declaring one thing. It was very simple. It was very straight. He was declaring the truth of God. That we're dead in our sins. That we need repentance to turn back to new life to God. That's all John had in his arsenal. That's all he needed. He didn't need the miracles. Jesus used the miracles to authenticate himself. John wasn't about authenticating himself. He was about pointing others to Jesus. He lived a simple life from what we know. He was faithful to his message. 
in his mission for God. He knew it from before he was born to the time that Jesus showed up and he could rejoice when he saw that mission come to fruition. And he could remain firm to that mission even up to including his own martyr's death at the hands of Herod. He wasn't distracted by the things of the world and he wasn't enticed by the glory of men. That's the light, those are the priorities of John that enable him to live out his purpose in God's plan. God has used many witnesses to point to Jesus. He certainly uses his word. He uses the works of Jesus. The Holy Spirit himself is active and moving among us, God himself. But part of God's plan has always been to use us individually and collectively to bear witness about the light of life in Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. It's why we're here. It's not about us, just like John's life was not about him. And this is the fact. The world desperately needs us to be living out God's plan today. The world is blinded, this picture. And you can see the joy in the one who can see that can keep the people of the world from walking into the things that are right before us, but that we can't see in the blindness that we have in our sin. You and I have the blessing to bring the joy of the light of Jesus, the new life of Jesus, into the lives of those around us as God uses us in the places that he takes us. And make no mistake, we're not calling people to ourselves. We're not calling people to our buildings or our programs. We're not calling people to the good works. We're not calling people to our great studies. We're not calling people to our great ideas about God or our great ideas for God. Those might be things that God allows us to use in our true calling. What we're calling people to is a relationship with a person who is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. That's it. All those other things can go away, but the message stays the same. John didn't have buildings. He didn't have programs. He didn't have miracles. What he had was the message of the truth of God that was pointing everyone towards their need for a Savior. And that's what we have. And that was the priority he lived with. And it's a priority that we have to stay focused on, church. Grounded in God's word. Grounded in God's truth. Not in the things that makes the world happy, but what makes the world healthy and whole again by helping it to take those blinders off to see the light of Christ. And that's our purpose here this morning as well. If you're here and you have not placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, His offer is eternal life and salvation through belief in Him as your Lord and Savior. What is He asking you to do? What's He calling to you this morning? What's He saying? His invitation is to come into the light, to know eternal life, and come back to your Father in heaven who's waiting. Church, the world's in darkness. They desperately need what God's provided in Jesus. So as you celebrate with your family and your friends this Christmas, let them know this Christmas what completes your joy. And it's not in what you get. It's not in what you give. It's not what you do for others or what others do for you. Let them know Jesus is the one who completes your joy and will complete their joy in life and forevermore. Join me in prayer. God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the light that he brings into the world. We thank you, God, for those that you've used in our lives to help us take off the things that blinded us to your presence among us and around us and your desire to live within us. We thank you for your spirit that you've given us to navigate life, to be used as a light in the world for others. And God, my prayer is that you would take the hearts and the passions of the people here at Calvary Grace and just give them that desire to be used by you to be a witness that bears light to your Son, that all might believe through your work through us, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.